views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, nice to see you. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to writers and editors and reporters and journalists and photographers and videographers and filmmakers, anybody who's putting stuff out in the Bronx so that you know exactly what uh, they've been working on. You get a little insight into the background. This evening, we have two great reporters, one who covers the state of New York and the other one who covers a neighborhood in the, the Bronx. So we'll give you, we'll literally cover the world for you uh, this evening. Uh, my pleasure to welcome back to the program, Jeff Colton from City and State New York. Nice to have you with us, Jeff. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back, Gary. Uh, Jeff, you know, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of you. I'm a fan of Here's the Paper. This is the magazine for this week. And um, the whole um, thing was dedicated to voting. And uh, <laughs> gee, you think that's an important uh, topic of conversation? But what I was most fascinated uh, by, and by surprise, was that you uh, were a poll worker this year. Um, explain to me, number one, why you did it, and number two, what you discovered. Yeah, sure. So poll workers in the city of New York, I think the average age uh, is over 60, maybe even over 70. It's uh, typically a lot of seniors that work the polls. But this year, the city of New York was asking younger people to work because uh, a lot of seniors uh, were staying home uh, because of the coronavirus. So I saw my opportunity and I thought, you know, this would be great to learn uh, how the polls work behind the scenes. I'm used to going and taking pictures as a journalist. Uh, so I was excited to get an opportunity to, uh, you know, help people vote and stand next to a, 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 a scanning machine and help people uh, scan their ballots. And then, best of all, I got to give them the little I voted sticker at the end. Uh, I, the, there were a number of revelations, and I, I certainly recommend this is the magazine. Of course, it's online. You can uh, read Jeff's work in there. Um, what really interested me was the errors that you found that people made. Now, there was a lot of talk about machines, and we could talk about all that. But I wasn't aware, because it was always relatively clear to me, that so if you voted, let's just say, for president, you voted for uh, whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden, you just voted once. But you're saying, according to your, your firsthand reporting, um, people voted for Joe Biden on the Democratic line and, let's say, the working families line. And that, of course, invalidates the ballot. T tell us a little bit about that. That's right. A lot of the presidential candidates and candidates for other seats uh, appear on multiple ballot lines. So yes, Joe Biden might be on the ballot as a Democrat and also a member uh, or the candidate for the Working Families Party. Now you as a voter have to choose which party you want to vote under, but uh, a lot of voters that I ran into uh, saw Joe Biden's name twice and they checked it both times. Uh, however, then the ballot doesn't count. Uh, so I saw this as, uh, as frankly, uh, a little bit concerning just about the way that the instructions are not relayed, uh, you know, well to the voters, or maybe that too many voters are not reading the directions. Admittedly, it's right there. But uh, I mean, look, I, I vote too. I don't read all the directions. I just kind of do, you know, I, I go down, I, I mark the ballot, whatever. So my overall concern is that, uh, you know, I think the Board of Elections needs to be very careful about educating voters and more importantly about educating poll workers who are actually there on the ground to educate the voters on election day. And so in that circumstance, what did you do? You simply had them go redo the ballot? Uh, because I'm assuming the machine wouldn't accept it. That's right. If you vote uh, for more than one candidate in a row, it's called overvoting and the, the ballot scanner uh, sends it back. It does not allow you to vote. And then you can go to the table, get a second ballot and try again. So, you know, it's not a huge crisis. I think, uh, you know, everybody's vote was still counted when they tried a second time, but uh, yeah, it's still a headache, it's, it's time. And I'm sure that there's people whose votes ended up not counting if they just gave up or, you know, walked away. 
Right, right. Well, I, I thought it was a fascinating uh, revelation. Uh, there were other revelations, not only in the uh, piece by, uh, uh, by you, but um, some of your colleagues had recommendations for the Board of Elections. Uh, we don't have enough time to get into them because you and I could spend a lot of time in this stuff. But there are a couple of uh, important things that I do want to get to. Uh, one is uh, the announcement by a council member, a high profile council member in the Bronx, Rafael Salamanca Jr. said he was going to be running for borough president. You know, I, I looked at it and said, well, that's interesting. And then, of course, I blanched because I was like, wait a minute, here's a guy who could have been up for speaker of the city council, and he's going to be giving up his seat completely. Uh, you interviewed him. You presented a very interesting uh, back and forth with um, uh, the council member. Uh, what are your thoughts about him giving up his council seat to run for borough president? Yeah, uh, Rafael Salamanca is a very interesting character. He represents uh, a lot of the South Bronx, Hunts Point, and areas around there, around St. Mary's Park. Uh, and Salamanca, he is, uh, you know, one of the more powerful council members. He is the chairman of the land use committee, which means that he has a say on, uh, you know, so much of the development in the entire city. But uh, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. is term limited. And that means there's going to be an opening in the Bronx Borough Presidency uh, in 2021. And Salamanca saw an opportunity, you know, even though many did consider him as a potential city council speaker, be the most powerful city council member uh, starting in next year, the year after that, 2022. He uh, instead said, no, you know what, let me be Bronx Borough President. He basically explained it as, look, he, at the Bronx has given him everything. He was born and raised there. He's always worked in the Bronx. And uh, he sees this as an opportunity to shape the borough. A highly competitive race. Um, we're shooting this uh, show on Wednesday. We understand that um, uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson will be announcing a campaign very soon. I mean, the other candidates, uh, Fernando Cabrera uh, has made it clear, and in fact, he said it on our program, that he wants to be the, the borough president. Um, Natalia Fernandez, an assembly member, said she wants to be the borough president. There's rumors, I haven't gotten to speak to him yet, but uh, that Senator Sepulveda wants to be the borough president. Um, is it a risk? Uh, I mean, and, and it's an interesting risk. He's got a good career and a good job. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, he's got more money than the other candidates at this moment. So maybe that makes him a favorite of sorts. I, I just think it's interesting. It's an interesting career choice. It definitely is. And uh, I mean, yes, there's so many angles to look at this. I think one interesting one is that for the past uh, many years, the uh, borough president has been a male of Puerto Rican descent. Rafael Salamanca fits that descriptor. Uh, of course, there are candidates that will be uh, that are also male Puerto Ricans, like uh, Senator Fernando Cabrera, yeah, Fernando Cabrera as well. Uh, but then we see also some women trying to win, as well as uh, Vanessa Gibson, who is an African American woman. Uh, and it will be a very interesting uh, way that the candidates are going to try and, and win over voters and win over their blocks of voters in in this borough. One of the things I'm concerned with, and, and we've talked about it before, is that this adds another empty council seat in the Bronx. And I, I should have counted before we got here, but I think we're up to five or six that are going to be um, up for grabs, which means the Bronx will have a whole new council delegation. Um, you know, Salamanca could have been, you know, it only takes one term to become a senior member. He could have been a senior member of um, of, of that group, but now it also, it puts a lot into play in the Bronx and that um, there's gonna be a lot of candidates running for office. I mean, it's going to be, certainly for me and I presume for you, a very interesting uh, political season as we get into June. Definitely, and I actually have to plug uh, for any of the viewers here that live in Co-op City, Wakefield, that Northwest Bronx area, there is a special election to fill the city council seat on December 22nd, it's coming up very soon. I think uh, early Next week already opened up, I know. So uh, anybody there, uh, the former council member, Andy King, he was expelled from the city council. So there's an opening and uh, there's a special election that's happening right now. So uh, as we speak, yeah. uh, you, you're preaching to the choir. I moderated a debate between the three candidates, um, uh, which is running on Bronx Talk uh, this week. So folks, 
there's the cross promotion for you. Um, listen, speaking of what's coming up, uh, I you did a you did a, a write up, which is almost like a, a weekly thing, as to who's the latest uh, mayoral candidate to announce. And let's see, what do we got? Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven candidates. I'm going to do them real quick. Eric Adams, Sean Donovan, Catherine Garcia, Zach Iskall, uh, Ray McGuire, Carlos Menchaca, Diane Morales, Max Rose, Scott Stringer, Lori Sutton, and Maya Wiley. How, how does a voter, and, and I'm being very, it may, may sound kind of funky here, how does a voter sort through this? I mean, they're, they're all Democrats. Um, and many, in many cases, they lean left. They feel very similar about issues. How do you sort through, uh, aside from reading what um, Jeff Kotlin uh, writes about, um, uh, how do you sort through it? On the bright side, we're, we're looking ahead right now to the June 2021 primary. So we have six months to go until many New Yorkers will be voting for mayor. And of course, as we know, whoever wins the Democratic primary is almost guaranteed to win the general election. Uh, so you have six months. And my goal is just that people tune in early. You know, you don't just decide to start researching the candidates the week before you vote. But I hope that people are paying attention in the, in the uh, you know, the, the work, the work up to that June primary, paying attention, learning about the candidates, because uh, there is a lot to learn. I'm still learning about these candidates, their positions, but uh, the earlier you start paying attention, then uh, the more confident you can be in your vote in June. That's, a, that's actually pretty good advice. I have to tell you that, that it, no, it, it makes um, uh, a lot of sense. What do you think, uh, just prognosticating now at a very early stage. And of course, maybe not all of them will get to the ballot. I mean, there's a lot that could go on. Um, what do you think will be the predominating issue that will really capture voters and, and really help determine this? Is it, is it an issue? Is it ethnicity? Is it a, is it a desire to have uh, someone like Maya Wiley be the first woman uh, mayor of the city of New York? I mean, wh what do you think is going to carry the day here? Is it money, campaign money? I don't know. Oh, man, I mean, it, there are <laughs> many issues. This is, this is, in my mind, the second best office in the, city, in the country after presidency. Uh, this is a huge election. Um, and obviously, coronavirus will be a huge issue, even though we're hoping by next summer that, uh, you know, we're in better shape. Yeah, we'll be in better shape. But at the very least, we are going to be facing uh, some serious budgetary issues, many closed businesses, many people still out of work. And I think uh, voters are very much gonna be looking to somebody that they can trust to uh, kind of build the city back after this pandemic. That, that's actually, a, uh, I think, pretty smart analysis. In other words, out of all the things that are out there and goodness gracious is development <laughs> and all that, but it's who can who can really rebound help rebound us and have the vision to do that um uh jeff colton from uh city and state new york thank you so much for joining us as i said one day we're gonna have a four-hour show and you and i will get really get into each candidate and each issue and we'll make it happen but you're a great guest and and your work uh, and and uh, at city and state is fantastic and all, all the reporters there who come on our show and uh the new editor-in-chief um, uh, ralph ortega um you're just doing a great job Job. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you around town, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Gary. Great. Uh, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to we're going to minimize things. We're going to uh, talk to one of the young reporters at the Mott Haven Herald. So uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. we
Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. And uh, I am thrilled, as I said, we were gonna localize our dialogue a little bit. And uh, let's bring on a, a Mott Haven Herald reporter who has been with us before, a little while back. Uh, Griffin Kelly, nice to have you with us, Griffin. Oh, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, Griffin, just uh, so people will know who you are, your, your name, not quite a household name just mm -hmm. yet. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the Mott Haven Herald and um, you know what, what you do for them and those kinds of things. And then we'll get into some subject matter. Yeah, surely. So uh, currently I'm a student with the, uh, the CUNY Journalism School. And uh, part of my reporting class is that I can easily submit to the Mott Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express, you know, two local papers in the South Bronx. And uh, I specifically cover housing and development. You um, uh, must be enjoying it. I mean, we were just talking briefly before the show. Uh, you couldn't get better training. I mean, you, you really are being a reporter. I can't imagine a better education. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's phenomenal. I like it. I appreciate the beat. You know, I think it's very important to that specific community. It'd be a little bit easier, you know, if uh, we weren't cooped up inside, I'd be able to like go out and meet some folks, uh, more folks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we hadn't talked about uh, this um, because you hadn't written about it yet. Uh, on December 31st, there is that um, uh, eviction moratorium that's gonna be lifted. Uh, have you heard anything about it? Have you um, had any dialogue about it? I mean, it'd be very interesting to see what happens if there's relief before that, or if in fact, goodness gracious, the idea that people would be evicted is, is pretty, pretty darn scary. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, no, I haven't necessarily been covering that aspect. I've mm -hmm. been reading a few things, you know, in the city. I've uh, talked to some uh, coworkers about it or fellow students. Um, and like you say, yeah, maybe like a stimulus package that could be approved, could help that, could help mitigate it. Um, who knows yeah who knows well let's talk about uh, development you a little while back a couple of weeks ago uh, you had wrote a uh, story about a community board uh, voting down uh, a development um, now of course that's only advisory but let's talk about what the development is or was and uh, where it is at right now and why um, uh, people in the bronx in this case the community board is not for it mm -hmm. yeah so the development it's on a uh, concord avenue uh, neighborhood. It's mainly, you know, old manufacturing type stuff, uh, a lot of car lots or rather uh, car repair places, low rises. And the uh, proposed development is an 11 story affordable housing development with 92 units. Um, and the big thing that happened, it was proposed by First Grand Cord Realty and the developer's name is Nissan Cohen. And like you said, this is the advisory board. You're supposed to get support from them first if you want to build or get a rezoning or something like that. He kind of went around that, didn't do that first, just went straight to the city planning commission and uh, they did certify the rezoning. Nobody in the community was happy about it though. Mm -hmm. That particular, no, I, I don't know that plot of land specifically, but when you say Concord Avenue, that's of course uh, uh, rings a bell because many people know that that's where the replacement jail for uh, in the Bronx for Rikers is going to be. It would seem interesting to me that if you're a developer knowing that uh, th there's a jail coming right nearby, I don't know, you know, it's like I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what would be the logic. In other words, if I'm a developer looking to place housing, I'm not going to say, hey, where should I put it? Maybe they got the property cheap or something, but putting it in that neighborhood or in that spot, I, I, I'm not getting it, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, it's exactly like you said right there. It might just be cheap land, easy to develop in the, or, you know, cheap to develop over there. Um, and especially a lot of people pointed out, this would just be an odd development. You know, again, it's 11 stories, much bigger than anything there. Um, a lot of these places are just low rise and they were, you know, homes for way back years ago when this was a big manufacturing area and people worked at these, you know, plants or these uh, warehouses and they lived right next door. But that type of uh, economy, I guess, doesn't necessarily exist there as much anymore. That's right. In other words, if you're going to build housing, I, I, listen, I, I'd be honest with you, I haven't studied the project or anything about it. But if you're going to build housing and you're serious about improving people's lives and giving them an opportunity, 
one would think you'd take all those things in consideration. The problem is, as you well know, people really are desperate for housing. They're desperate for affordable housing, but you're, you're perpetuating the wrong things, you know? And, and, and you uh, characterized and said there's, there's auto lots and all that. Well, that's exactly what happened uh, with that auto lot uh, over there by, um, uh, on Concord Avenue where that, where that uh, uh, jail is uh, uh, coming. Um, a, a story that you and I actually collaborated on, we had some dialogues beforehand, was um, this idea about a tenant association president running for office. So it got you a chance to talk to some of the NYCHA um, uh, you know, uh, presidents, et cetera. Let, before we even get into that story, um, what did you find when you spoke to uh, some of those people? Well, it really felt like a lot of people were fed up, you know, with how the city is being run. And this is, I think, what I run into most when I'm talking with folks who either live in NYCHA buildings or, you know, they're uh, uh, tenant association members or tenant presidents, people like that. Uh, they just don't really feel as if the city is on their side. And, uh, you know, a side story to that is, you know, this blueprint for change, you know, a lot of people don't feel that this is in the best interest, uh, interests of the tenants. Well, where, where, where did that blueprint for change come from? That uh, recently developed by, uh, you know, I guess the new director, Gregory Russ and mm -hmm. uh, his team. And it's kind of complicated, but it would almost make this uh, privatized aspect of NYCHA. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. say it wouldn't. But when you look at it, you're like, this just really sounds like privatized housing. Mm -hmm. And I, that might displace a lot of people. Well, one of the things that always interests me with young journalists, and I hope you don't mind me characterizing you like Go that, right ahead. is <laughs> you stand proud, uh, is um, the whole notion of, um, uh, uh, you know, you getting to experience this and interact with people. Um, maybe you haven't um, had a large uh, experience with NYCHA tenants and the things they go through. Um, what, what have you learned and what was that experience like for you uh, in just doing these interviews and hearing what they had to say? I'm, I'm going to comment on whatever you say because I have my own point of view about it. But I'm just curious about how the whole dialogue and interaction struck you. Well, I think uh, it kind of hits me on a personal level. You know, I'll, I'll admit it. it's like, yes, I'm a young white man from the suburbs and I'm speaking with a lot of uh, black folks, uh, with Latinx folks, people of color who don't come from as well off of a background as I do. So when I hear them talking about the conditions that they have to live in or the issues that they have to put up with, I'm just like, you know, it really makes you think, take a second look. And it makes me want to report these stories and get that word out there. That, that I, you know, I can certainly appreciate it. My, my reaction, and I have uh, I know many of the people, as you know, we, we work together on contacts and who they are, et cetera, et cetera, is, and, and I can fully, fully empathize with their saying, you know what, another blueprint for change you're talking about privatization. None of this gets to fixing our pipes, making sure we have water, making sure we have heat. None of it gets to that because it's all talk. Uh, you know, the estimates have been that you need eight or $12 billion to really fix what's going on with NYCHA. And I think until uh, NYCHA residents hear that, they ain't going to believe anything. Blueprint, you know, schmooprint. You know? mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's uh, that's uh, my attitude. Uh, you covered um, the election and election day. Um, it, it, uh, we know <laughs> now we know what the results are. Um, <laughs> but you uh, talked to first time voters who voted um, in, in this election. Uh, we know that across the country, more people came out to vote than ever before. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you discovered talking to voters on November 4th, 2020. I think the biggest thing that I got out of it was that, you know, people really do just uh, hold it in their hearts as like a privilege and a right, even if they don't know why they're doing it. You know, I've talked to a lot of first time voters who are like, well, it's the thing to do. You know, I, I'm allowed to do it. So let's go do it. And I would ask questions like, yeah, but is there anything local or federal that's important to you? And they're like, 
no nothing right now you know well that's that's interesting and sad because of course this election was um, uh, you know enormous consequences uh and even uh, locally uh in the 15th uh, congressional district uh, there was the opportunity to vote for a um a potentially a new uh, and now it turns out there will be a new congress member for the retiring jose serrano so i think it sounds to me like you revealed kind of a lack of uh, voter education a little bit you know i think it's also when you talk to first time voters a lot of people i were talking to they're 18 19 21 uh i'd imagine a lot of 18 19 21 year olds don't have certain social issues or economic issues on their mind no matter where they come from um it's just a hard thing to keep up with you know when you're a high schooler or maybe a college student it's just not something you think about maybe well well i mean this is part of the education that it is maybe it, it should be <laughs> you know it's easy for me and you to say uh, it should be something to think about but maybe uh, it needs to be approached uh, in another way or reach uh, reach out in another way um i i just uh, cond- did an interview earlier today and somebody asked me what i thought about the involvement and the engagement or lack thereof of young people. And we expressed uh, uh, similar things that in some pockets, we see a lot of real advocacy and a belief in trying to move things forward, but in other places, um, not so much, you know, it's just, uh, okay, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Anyway, uh, Griffin Kelly from the uh, Mott Haven Herald, uh, uh, let's talk about what's next for you. Now, you you got a little time off, boy, I wish I was a student. (laughs) (laughs) I would say so, yeah. Um, uh, So my semester, my first semester just ended. I think it starts up again, like Mm -hmm. mid-January. But I plan to, you know, keep covering Mont Haven, South Bronx, Hunts Point area. I'd like to keep up on all the community board meetings and land use meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think you necessarily get a picture of a beat or an idea of what a geographic area is like until you've reported on it for like, two and a half, maybe three years. So I've only done a couple of months. I can't necessarily leave now. Which leads to, we're going to have to wrap up, which leads to my my final question here. Um, you'll be going, you'll be coming back. Um, you like the idea of reporting in the Bronx? I do. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I'm a big proponent of local news and I think it's a spot that really needs it. Oh, boy, do we have. That's why we do what we do on BronxNet to begin with. Anyway, uh, Griffin Kelly, uh, let's read him in the Mott Haven Herald. Uh, enjoy your time off, but don't take a lot of time off. We need You're good, man. We need you to be writing the good stuff about uh, Borough of the Bronx. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great. Uh, folks, that's it. Thanks to uh, Jeff Colton from uh, City and State New York, and also uh, to Griffin Kelly from uh, the Mott Haven Herald. Uh, our great producer is uh, Rebecca, and our assistant producer is Sienna. And um, uh, happy holidays to all, and uh, to all a good night. We'll see you around.